Um, my name is Eric Benbow. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Entomology and Osteopathic Medical Specialties at Michigan State University. And I'm also a, fe a fellow with the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. And so what I want to do today is give you a little bit of background of, of kind of how I got into it, because a lot of scientists, um, research scientists in academia who do forensics have a background that wasn't directly related to forensics at the beginning. Um, and then I'm going to give you a little introduction um, to, to death and decomposition, the necrobiome, and then some past and current research related to the postmortem microbiome. And then uh, one specific case study, but some research case studies as well. And then um, what are the challenges and outlooks on how we're, we want to use the postmortem microbiome in forensics? Um, the research in my lab centers on how insects and microbes interact in this, this triangular fashion within aquatics, disease, and carrying systems. And we address questions related to the ecology and evolution of these relationships and then how they can be applied. And over the last couple of years, um, I, I was originally trained in aquatic entomology, but did a postdoc with someone who did forensic entomology. And that got me interested into some basic questions of when something dies, um, um, some kind of bird or animal, what happens to it? And what are the organisms involved with that death? And how can we use um, that information for applications in forensics? And so it started with insects, but along the way, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, um, we figured out that the microbes associated with something uh, decomposing could potentially be used in forensic investigations. And, uh, several other research groups were doing the same thing, um, developing a microbial clock, if you will, using an entire microbial communities in, um, in their ability to determine how long someone's been dead, perhaps where they've been, maybe how they've died, or in aquatic circumstances, how long a body's been submerged. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the background of that and then some uh, research and then some uh, future challenges. For those of you who um, may be sensitive to dead uh, ant photos of dead animals or humans, um, I have not put a lot of those into this presentation, but there are a few, and um, you may want to either avert your eyes or uh, I'll leave the session. Um, death. Uh, unfortunately, uh, everything will, will end up dying, and humans in particular have expressed the fascination with death in, in many ways. And if you go to the Louvre in, in Paris, you can find lots of different artworks related to uh, the human perception of death and perhaps what um, is going on in the afterlife. And um, that's just been part of our history. If you look at ancient Egyptians and how they preserved their dead and mummified, um, there's been this interest in what happens to humans post-mortem. And another artwork, the, the macabre of understanding um, the, the leftover and the remains of something that was once living is profound and ubiquitous through, throughout art and throughout history, of course. And many of us ponder our own uh, mortality. I certainly do. But many others in forensics and researchers with regard to carrion um, and, and death uh, often think about how we can understand the process, the postmortem processes, natural processes, for utility in, in something like the justice system. And in many ways, we're finding for understanding public health um, and doing public health surveillance using the dead um, so that they can inform the living. And a few years ago, our work, uh, collaborative work, was um, highlighted in the New York Times Magazine where the author was quite interested in the microbes, you know, the microscopic, microscopic organisms um, associated with their bodies. But you'll see in the hourglass, there's a renditions, cartoon renditions of bacteria, but also those yellow um, images are, are maggots or larvae from flies. And what we were discussing is how we can use both microbes and insects to determine how long someone's been dead, or perhaps how long someone's been submerged in water, or someone's bottled in this case. And part of that was describing the collective 
uh, community of organisms that recycle, that have evolved to recycle decomposing or dead vertebrate organisms. And, um, and, and not just uh, vertebrate organisms, that's for forensics, but anything that has been once living has biomass that is recycled back into nature. And so I draw this red line around this box. This is necromass. That's any form of organic matter that was once living and now is being recycled. And there's a saprophage community that physically degrades that. But a focus for this presentation is the external and internal microbial communities or the microbiomes of that necromass. And then the substrate upon which that necromass is laying or a body's laying or in a water body, there's a, also a microbial communities that colonize that organic matter. And so what we've been interested in is understanding these processes and then potentially how to develop uh, new tools that can be used in forensic investigations. So let me give you a little uh, photo montage uh, related to a publication that we had. Um, this is an Easter gray kangaroo. These blow flies, that, these adult blow flies that you see, are um, both eating a little bit, but also mating, and then they're ovipositing, meaning they're laying eggs on a carcass. And this happens within minutes, sometimes hours, sometimes days, even with human bodies. And lots of, uh, many researchers have used insects as evidence to determine how long something's been dead. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so they are the main players for this presentation related of the necrobiome um, that interact with microbes in a way that we think can be used in uh, forensic investigations. Some of the work and research related to understanding microbe insect interactions on carcasses goes from um, aquatic organisms such as uh, Pacific uh, salmon, where they spend most of their life in the ocean and then migrate into the rivers and streams, spawn, and then have mass death. Um, lots of research has gone into the natural history of these processes. And we've learned a lot about how microbes and insects interact during the decomposition of salmon. The blowflies themselves lay these eggs, they look like little pieces of rice. Those eggs hatch within a few hours, uh, within about a day, sometimes less, depending on the temperature. And then they start consuming that carcass. And so they play a major role in how the microbes um, may affect their attraction, but also how the insects may affect the microbial communities of that dead body. Other sources of necromass, like dung and dung beetles, uh, dung beetles have evolved uh, intricate uh, relationships with dung, recycling the dung, uh, breeding on the dung, and raising their offspring on the dung as well. And so we've learned a lot about decomposition uh, with those types of studies. In aquatic systems, there aren't very many um, insects or other invertebrates that have evolved to consume the carcass itself. But in this case, these caddisflies are consuming the microbial biofilm on the carcass itself. And you can see the white patches where the caddisflies have scraped that microbial biofilm off. And I'll show later in a case study where that biofilm growth on a body might be used to determine how long that body's been submerged. For instance, we could probably, with more research, determine how long this salmon has been sitting at the bottom of the stream, just based on the community composition and diversity of the microbial communities um, in that biofilm. And then there's vertebrate scavengers that usually get the, the most pressed with uh, carrion ecology because they certainly modify the carcass itself, but they also modify how the insects colonize the carcass and the microbial communities within it as well. But in general, everything once living dies. That organic matter that was once living becomes recycled into nature, whether that's a log, a millipede, leaf litter, or a vertebrate carcass, as in D, a kangaroo in Australia. And we're focused on those vertebrate carcasses because they, resemble, they, they uh, act as surrogates for how we understand human decomposition and the biological interactions that occur during that time. But you can also see it in art. And uh, in the 13th century, this um, Japanese art form of uh, uh, portraying sequential decay of a cadaver um, in, in quite interesting detail. Again, this is the necrobiome of the community of organisms that have evolved to consume and ultimately recycle uh, a human body. And so 
It's here where we want to understand the basic biological mechanisms and ecological mechanisms of the necrobiome to determine the time of death of the postmortem interval. As I said, I got my start in forensic entomology, and there's an entomological clock that we use. So on day one, the adult flies come in, lay their eggs. The eggs hatch into early instar larvae. After three to seven days, they're a little bit bigger, uh, and then they begin to pupate after about eight or nine days. This clock, though, is temperature dependent, meaning it happens faster if it's hot and slower if it's cold. And but either way, if you, if you collect a maggot from a body and you know the species and you know its size, you can often back calculate, if you know the temperature, on how long those um, flies, larvae, have been on the body. And that has been used in the court of law um, hundreds of times. Part of our research was understanding the variability in those insects and how they colonize and how quickly they colonize. And in this particular study, we saw we put out six swine carcasses and note the variability just between carcass A and carcass B of how much insect activity is on B but not on A. And so we were curious what leads to this variability in insect activity. And through several experiments and published papers, we found it's the microbial communities, the, the suite of organisms from prokaryotes, bacteria, to protozoans, to microscopic worms and fungi that interact in meaningful ways to recycle the body. And we wanted to determine if we could figure out signatures or profiles of these microbial communities that could act as a clock, like an entomological clock, but using microbial succession communities. Well, at the same time, huge papers were coming out on the medical importance of microbes through the Human uh, Microbiome Project, Earth Microbiome Project, um, Additional papers came out first saying that microbes uh, outnumbered human cells 10 to 1. That was later um, adjusted to be 1 to 1. Nevertheless, microbes make up a huge part of the human body. Other research and other groups have started looking at this, whether it's the microbiology of the built uh, environment, uh, cardiology, interdisciplinary microbiome projects, et cetera. Microbes are interacting with living humans can we use those microbes for understanding the dead? Um, part of the microbiome project is understanding how symbiosis and maybe even non-symbiotes affect how an organism like ourselves interacts and, and is modified in the environment. Because we know microbiota modulate or can be modulated through antibiotics, probiotics, prebiotics. There's a genetic background for each of us in our diet and state that affects um, the microbiota of us. Um, given this variability, can we still understand these communities in a way that can be useful for forensics? Because we, we're each made up of billions of these microbes in our system. Well, there have been a slew of papers that have um, been published over the last 10 years related to this, usually using surrogate animals, but if they're not using surrogate animals, they've been using human human remains, usually through uh, human donors and anthropological research facilities. Amazing work has come from these, in, uh, including uh, Jessica Metcalf's work um, using uh, human remains um, in a couple of different facilities and determining uh, uh, a microbial clock. Um, others have used uh, human remains, usually uh, four to seven of them um, in, in these anthropological facilities where they monitor the communities, the microbial communities, over time. Some of our work, uh, however, has led to us collaborating with a medical examiner in Michigan where we're doing larger scale surveys of, um, of, of human cases, death cases, during routine autopsy and death investigation. Um, both types of um, studies provide keen insight into um, how human remains decompose and how the microbial communities change. But what's unique to forensics and what we found working with that medical examiner is there's unique cases of, for instance, um, two children that were frozen for multiple years. And that gets into some of the challenges associated with um, 
using information, directly using information for direct, for casework. Um, a body's placed in plastic and buried for two years. Um, the microbial communities of a um, cadaver that's laid on the ground for years are going to be quite different than that placed the, you know, on the body placed in, in plastic and buried. And so we're keen to understand the variability in not only uh, of human microbiomes, how it varies across space and time, but also related to circumstances and manner and cause of death because we think there's still signatures that are useful, but we need to, uh, enough research to identify those signatures. There's been many other studies uh, um, uh, in the past several years uh, here in this table that you can see, look at the total number of subjects. Uh, most of those that are between two and 20 are at anthropological research facilities. The ones with 28, 46, 188 are, have been those that have, have used um, cases during uh, death investigation. But let me give you a little bit of a background on how we understand and develop that microbial clock. And I'm going to do that with a study from a master's student of mine, uh, Courtney Weatherby, where she um, exposed six swine carcasses over the course of a full uh, length of decomposition from fresh remains to what you see on the very right-hand side, um, the bones and, and skin and some um, uh, dry tissue. And what I want to note here is that when you first see micro, um, in, insect communities, is about 1557 accumulated degree hours, ADH. That's when the uh, major insect activity was evident. And that's going to become important because what we did was swab these um, carcasses over time, as long as there was skin available. We then analyzed the microbial communities over time on the carcass, but we also swab the maggot masses, those large maggot masses that you see at 1845 and 2469. Um, we got the secretions and excretions of the maggots themselves and looked at that microbiome. And then we would sample some of those insects and um, look at the internal microbiome of those insects as they grew on the carcass over time. Because the hypothesis was that any dead organisms has its own microbiome, but the flies that are attracted to, naturally involved attraction to the carcass carry their own microbes. And when they oviposit or lay, lay, lay those eggs and investigate the carcass like I showed with that kangaroo, they deposit their own microbial communities. And that certainly has an effect, and there's been published papers um, on this, it has an effect on how the communities, the microbial communities change on the dead body. And so we wanted to investigate how those microbes change. And in the meantime, that also allows us to develop a microbial clock on this. So that's how we suggest that as the, the larvae grow and develop, they then acquire those microbes that were once part of the um, cadaver, but also part of what the adult um, flies brought into the system. So this looks like a complicated slide. On the x-axis is accumulated degree hours. Essentially, that's time that has been adjusted for um, temperature variability among those six swine carcasses. And then on the y-axis, you see the mean phyla relative abundance. So this is these are entire phylums, phyla, of bacteria. And if you look at right before the insects became evident on the carcasses, and so that's the top part. And if you look at the skin microbiome, what you see is proteobacteria pretty low early on, but right when this, the insects colonize, they start to jump higher. Firmicutes are high and then go lower once the insects are there. And so if you're doing a microbial clock without accounting for insect evidence, you might have some variability that you can't explain. So once the insects were there, we started monitoring with the dashed lines, the maggot mass, community, so that's just when we put a swab into the mass and got the excretions and secretions. That's the small line, and you can see proteobacteria still remain high, the firmicutes are lower. If you then look at the larvae and the internal microbiome of the larvae, the large, fatter dashed lines, you can see that the proteobacteria continue to increase as the larvae increase in size as well. And at 2469, you can see that there was nothing remained of skin that we could use 
to, that we could swap for the skin communities. So effectively, that carcass has gone from a swine to essentially a large population of insects in their excretions and, and secretions. Um, that is part of developing this microbial clock where you take sequential samples as a carcass or human cadaver decomposes over time. But in real life death investigations, you only get one time to sample this, sample the, the case. Um, and so it's important to understand how much variability there is not only on a body, but among bodies or cases within certain populations of, of, of humans. And so we published this a couple of years ago in terms of validating that um, research microbial clock of sequential samples over time because we could only sample them once um, during the death investigation. So our questions were, what is the postmortem microbial diversity? How does body site, sex, age, or manner of death affect the estimated postmortem post interval? And does the living environment influence the microbiota? So we worked with the medical examiner, Dr. Carl Schmidt uh, of Wayne County in Detroit. Uh, uh, with his cases and his crew would collect swab samples from the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, umbilicus, and rectum. Those were stored at negative 20 and until we were able to um, analyze them. The metadata, here's a slew of metadata that we uh, recorded um, as part of the study. And then we were able to statistically evaluate and control for many of these um, covariates and to, term, to identify the microbial communities of, of importance. The swab went through a standard pipeline that uh, most of the, the labs doing this kind of work use. Um, we extract DNA, you have it sequenced. Uh, we're using 16S RNA, using MySeq. Um, we use two to analyze it and then R for data visualization, visualization and statistics. Well, we had 188 cases, lots of very uh, um, range. What you do should note is most of our cases were less than 49 hours. Uh, but we're pretty equal on females and uh, males, black and white, and a variety of um, manners and causes of death. Um, these were evaluated statistically to um, associate their variation. And what we got was body area makes a huge difference in the microbial community. So if you're not familiar with an ordination, and that's what this is, um, the closer the points are, the more similar the microbial, the collective microbial communities are. So rectum um, or, ordinates in clusters together pretty tightly, although there is some variability spread throughout those, those red points. The mouth also clusters down lower on the, the PCOA2 axis. The ears also cluster. And this is significant clustering, meaning the communities of the rectum, mouth, and ears are significantly different from each other. Note that the eyes and nose, which are part of the face, right, with the ears and mouth, are all part of the same system. Um, and so they're spread throughout and don't cluster as much. And so there's overlap in the microbial communities, but body site has an important effect. And so looking at body site for your microbial clock or your microbial metric of interest was very important, and so that's what we did. Um, to kind of summarize, what you're seeing here are several bar graphs looking at the mean 16S residual RNA diversity, meaning the number of species, if you will. And so that you get higher diversity at less, if, with cases less than 48 hours postmortem, and lower diversity after 49 hours postmortem. And so this was consistent in the eyes, ears, nose, and mouth, but not in the rectum. So this is an important finding, right? If you're going to use microbial communities in death investigation, you need to know where to sample. Uh, the rectum for this particular question is not effective. Not only was diversity um, different between uh, 48, less than 48 and greater than 49 um, postmortem intervals, but we, entire communities were in specific microbial taxa who could be used to predict um, those categories of postmortem interval. I won't, I won't get into the details of those, but you're welcome to, to read the paper and scientific reports. And lastly, I'm going to conclude with a, a case study um, when the postmortem microbiome probably would have helped. 
Um, this was featured on the Oxygen channel as part of the smiley face killers. Um, I have no opinion about the smiley face killers hypothesis, um, but we were asked to run an experiment because of a suspicious case as part of that series of Todd, Ga uh, Todd Guy. Um, and, and to summarize what the case was and why it was suspicious is um, Todd went to a, out to a party one evening in 2008, I believe, or 2007. Um, he was walking home, allegedly, speaking to his girlfriend, and abruptly the phone went dead. No one had heard from him or seen him for 21 days where his body was pulled from a small lake in Michigan. And upon uh, evaluation, uh, there was no, um, there was antidepressant drugs in his toxicology reports. However, interviews with his parents and friends suggested that he was not on any kind of you know, depressants or antidepressants and he wasn't depressed. And so um, being gone for, for, for his body being gone for 21 days was suspicious because of the way the body looked upon recovery. Um, and this was noted in the autopsy report and in photographs where there wasn't a lot of decomposition of the body that um, was floating in or submerged in a small lake for 21 days in the middle of summer. And so what we did was we ran an experiment with three pig carcasses in a small lake in Michigan. And we uh, swabbed several places on each one of the carcasses. And we evaluated how the external microbial communities changed on those carcasses over about a four week period. Um, and what we were interested in was these two extremes, meaning early floating in red versus advanced floating decay in blue, because we found that our carcasses um, were more in line of advanced floating decay condition um, than something that was much um, early floating, meaning with the microbial communities on our carcasses, um, early floating could we identify microbial communities that were early floating versus those that were advanced decay. And what you can see, real similar to our previous study in Detroit, um, in the uh, box and whisk whisker graphs on the left, those are metrics of diversity. So you get higher diversity of the microbial communities on the carcasses in early floating, the red, and much less diversity in the floating decay green or the advanced floating decay in blue. And that's pretty consistent along different metrics, suggesting the diversity significantly drops um, as decomposition or submergence progresses um, over the summer, over four weeks of summer. And if you look at that ordination again, what you see is the early floating clusters out independent of the others, and this is highly significant, whereas the green and the blue, the advanced stages of decomposition, uh, clustered a little bit together, but also separate. Now, if the body was really in or was in the water for 21 days, at the time of discovery, it would have taken microbial swabs we may have been able to differentiate the microbial communities of 21 days compared to the microbial communities of early floating, meaning three to five days of submergence. That's what our data suggests, that in the future work, if a body's found, let's swab the body, let's also take samples of the microbial communities of the habitat and determine if they match a high or low diversity community that might be representative of an early floating stage versus an advanced floating. Now, lots of questions remain with this case. This was just um, one experiment in one part of Michigan, and the, the results are not generalizable, but it um, shows promise on how understanding microbial communities and how they change over time could potentially be used in future death investigations. So the summary of this presentation, the necrobiome provides um, interesting ecological and evolutionary underpinnings that we might be able to use for forensic application, both in studies at anthropological facilities and with our larger um, case studies uh, with uh, real death investigations. We can predict PMI with reasonable accuracy. Um, many of those studies are at control facilities, which are less realistic but afford sequential um, sampling over time. Uh, the large-scale studies suggest there's variability, 
but we can at least determine before 48 and after 49 hours, which can be critical in a death investigation. So we think there's excellent potential for both postmortem microbes in most cases. What are those challenges? We need more confirmation and validation, both among studies and within studies. There's a lot of variability across cities, regions, and countries. How much variability is that, and does it affect the tools and standard operating procedures we'd like to put in place? Future pro protocols will be, need to be relatively quick, easy, and inexpensive. Because in addition, there's few opportunities to collaborate with medical examiner offices, and those offices are incredibly busy, and those investigations are incredibly busy, and they have a lot to do. And so they often suffer from tight budgets and crunch time, and so our future protocols have to be quick, easy, and inexpensive. Other challenges, really, how much, how much does the anti-mortem health condition impact the post-mortem microbiome? Our early studies have suggested that the anti-mortem health condition does affect the post-mortem microbiome, but we need additional studies to um, validate and test that. How, how does outdoor circumstances affect the variation? How do indoor circumstances, how does burial affect the PMI and microbiomes? So we need to track cases, archive, and data retrieval, and develop a database, which my collaborators and I have done. Um, here's the website for our human postmortem microbiome database, if you're interested. We're always interested in uh, collaborations. It's the largest ongoing data collection for the postmortem microbiome associated with determining manner and cause of death and postmortem intervals. Uh, we have over 15,600 plus individual samples, over 2,000 cases representing all kinds of manners and causes of death. Um, and it samples a, a population that's typically not sampled in um, microbiome studies where you get volunteers that are either healthy or have some kind of ailment to understand health consequences. Uh, I'd like to end with my um, very uh, tight team of collaborators, uh, Dr. Jennifer Peckall, Dr. Carl Schmidt, and Heather Jordan um, at various institutions, and some previous funding from the National Institute of Justice that allowed us to explore the variability in postmortem microbiome among uh, autopsy cases. So I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to answering many of your questions.